one. And here we are, Sam. I got my hat finally fixed. It's about What's fucking time. Ah, oh, dude, it's a uh, the little X uh, Hunter license symbol from Hunter Hunter. Oh. You see, I I had an issue when I got it where the very end uh, nub that kind of goes into the hat because you know it's a snapback and uh-huh. it's just like it kept popping open. Uh, all the snapping of the snapback was, was right, awful. Right. I couldn't keep this thing on my head to save my life, so I ended up just a little hit. thing. You know, shout yeah. out to the big head boys out there. <laughs> big head or lots of hair either way it, it could be kind of tough i feel the hair man hats don't work for me anymore it, it's tough i had to 3d print a little uh, thing that goes and connects it and then after that that started popping so i just grabbed some electrical tape and just wrapped that bitch nice do what yeah. you gotta do innovation yeah well you know innovating is how I learned to stop saying, you know, every sentence. So if I can learn to innovate, maybe I too can be a good DM one day. <laughs> character <laughs> development. I, I do love character development. I, I highly endorse any players to conspire with their DMs for character development. You don't have to do it on your own. You can get a little chat behind the scenes, behind yeah. the DM screen. We do that already. I highly encourage it. Because I like to conspire, and then like multiple players will come up to me, and they're like, "Hey, Orion, I want to do this thing," and I'm like, "Yeah, sure." Meanwhile, someone else also came up to me and had their little conspiring, and now I can kind of like uh, weave things together and cause mischief. Maybe some yeah. backstories are counter to each other. Maybe there's mm-hmm. intercharacter conflict. That could be spicy. Always love intercharacter conflict. I I, I love it. clashing of the morals. Hell yeah. Not enough of it. Not but enough. that being said, I think we should start the show. Dungeons and Talk Shows, the talk show that brings you monsters, news, and homebrews. I am your host, Orion. And I am your host, Sam. Welcome back to another episode. It's been a long week. Time on the road. Happy Uh, holidays to everyone, too. Dude, it was a big Turkish day. (laughs) Turkish day, yeah. Everyone loves the food and the family. Hope you guys had a good holiday. Well, you know, I survived. Uh, we need a little survival shirts for the holidays this time yeah. of year. But you, you, you know what? Thankfully, it, it's more than just you and me in the studio today. Uh, we have a yeah. special guest. Uh, how about you introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Thomas R. Wilson. Um, I am a professional writer, advocate, game master, storyteller, and just about everything else at this point. Oh, uh, I want to yeah. say thank you for having me here. Absolutely. Yeah, a man of many talents, many skills, yeah. many hats. Jack of all trades, right? Uh, m- master of the sum, <laughs> I would hope. <laughs> I always hated that master of none shit. It's like, oh, come on. You can't master at least one thing. They always say that, but like, if you're really good, you really got that bounce, and aren't you also a master of all? <laughs> that reminds me of this dude i used to know in high school where he would outwardly just declare himself and now he's one of the theater kids so uh, he, he just would come right out and he'd be like my name is dick crotchney lord of the penises the phallic master of all and god of congress yeah, <laughs> like, a, like a like a preacher <laughs> it was that's hilarious. the guy you've seen those videos where it's like Oh man, he's he's like uh, it's the dude with like the black hat. He's in like the gothic outfit, you know. He's in like the 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 manga <laughs> store. <laughs> he's like this one. I don't he's know. got a brother and a sister, and and, and they fuck. <laughs> you have it's no so idea how good. little that narrows it down. Oh my god! Somebody <laughs> out there will know what I'm talking about. 
I, I'm sure. <laughs> there are several videos. There was the one where he was like in front of the Satanic Temple. He was like standing in line. It was so oh, good. That, that's crazy. But that, that, that guy I mentioned, we, we played a lot of D&D back in the day. But I, I have to wonder, like, uh, how did you get your start with D&D, Thomas? Um, so I will be honest, um, I spent a good chunk of my life hearing about D&D. Um, my first real introduction was, you know, as a high school kid being told that I looked like the kind of person who would be- play D&D. Um, and that was like long before like nerddom became like so mainstream it like everybody considers them a nerd. Right. But I actually started playing um after I met my best friend and my big sister, she was playing with a group with her uh, boyfriend, now husband. Um, and they just asked me to play. And within like one game, I loved it. It, w- it was great. I actually started DMing like six months after I started playing because there were so many ideas and I had in my head. Oh, yeah. um, the conversation you were having about uh, character players developing their own backstory, I have to comment that on that as well. I absolutely mm-hmm. love when my players come up with like little path and arcs they want in their stories. It's fantastic. It makes the story so much better. Yeah. It really does. I, I love it, especially because the last campaign that I ran, I had players that would come up to me and they'd uh, be like, hey, I kind of want to do this and have a big reveal to the other players later on. And I'm like, I got you. And by the time that big reveal comes around, I had at least two players at the table crying. So, uh, yeah. you know, earn that little DM achievement right there. It also, like, you know, players love to see uh, their ideas in the game as well. They love to see what you can do with it. You know, then it takes off the pressure from you from having to write everything. I think it all works out. For sure, for sure. So you said you do uh, things like uh, community stuff, like kind of networking with people. Like, uh, could you tell us more about that? Yeah, um, so specifically within the D&D community, um, I help people within the neurodiverse community or even organizations that want to connect with the neurodiverse community, learn how to access them through um, active D&D play. I'm a big believer that there's, you know, thousands of games out there, so give those a try. So I've ran... Um, you know, many different systems, but really it's breaking down for a lot of businesses, a lot of people, how to connect to a community that I think a lot of people are scared to work with, not because they're scared of the people, but they want to honor and reflect like an appropriate level of care. But one of the things I love about d and I actually just did a talk on Friday about the power of sensory friendly events. Um, was I find that like so many people in the neurodiverse community are already playing the game or want to play the game. So a lot of my work involves just creating spaces at businesses or at locations or even online and helping foster that community connection, connection from people with neurodiversity or sensory needs or vision impairment or a variety of things to those community resources. It's a very complex thing that I'm breaking down like super quickly, but I hope that kind of helps to elaborate in a quick manner. Absolutely. Uh, Yeah, that's perfect because like my wife used to work with a lot of people that had special needs, uh, primarily children for a time. And she ended up uh, asking me to help her out with kind of designing some D and D type stuff that could kind of, give them a tool of expression, a way to be able to experiment with social interactions and and be more playful, yet being Mm -hmm. able to have uh, none of the real world repercussions that come from learning such social uh, interactions. Because some people, when you have like a neurodivergent things going on, like there is a broad spectrum of those things. And for some people, it can be more difficult to kind of pick up on certain cues so Mm -hmm. you can kind of like train those things through D &D. like we've had guests on the show in the past that use D D as a way to help people cope with trauma yeah Mm -hmm. yeah i mean we're 
huge advocates for you know the mental health side of DNA. So I can only imagine, you know, for someone who is struggling with that. Yeah, and I think another aspect of that, just to add what you're saying, is a lot of people forget with neurodiversity, with mental health needs, with any kind of diagnosis, there can be a disconnect in the processing of information. I'm actually a massive believer that a lot of the ways we educate people in the United States in particular, and I've heard from a lot of people as I've done talks that it's the same way in a lot of other countries, we teach people how we want them to learn not how they actually learn. And I've seen this in schools uh, from my own personal history. I've seen it in business. I've seen it in a lot of other things. And a lot of people don't realize if you're working with someone with any uh, level of extra need, sometimes people just need an extra 20 seconds. They need things to be slowed down. They need things to be taught in a different manner. And for some reason, a lot of people just jump to the mindset that people are going to learn the way I want them to, mm -hmm. no matter if it's effective or not, because they believe it should be. And I think that's actually one of the great powers of having a, a game master, or a storyteller, whatever you want to call it, at the table who understands that. Because when I give people the time to process, even if I have to repeat, the level of growth just in that is massive because people yeah. are being respected and taught and emphasized in the way that they process information. And that's actually something I try to tell a lot of people is just give people more time, slow yeah. down and really think about what you're saying from an empathic mindset. Absolutely. <laughs> and like usually that's that's what it is, you know, it's just you guys are taking the time to think about what you're saying. I think that adds a lot of social intelligence. Absolutely. I'm actually a massive believer that our society as a whole, even across countries, is making a massive change to the concept of wanting emotional intelligence, sometimes mm. even. I think you're absolutely right in that regard where we far too often, like if you've spent any amount of time on YouTube, you've probably come across the RPG horror stories. <laughs> Which, if you, uh, like, I have gone through many and many a video in that subject, and it seems to me that uh, oftentimes you could, you find, like, this one person in a group that, first off, they, they don't mesh whatsoever, and oftentimes it might be someone that has maybe some kind of neurodivergent, may, maybe some kind of autistic qualities that is just, like, they are thinking in a way that isn't how the other players are thinking. They, they aren't on the same wavelength. And because of that, that creates a misunderstanding of expectations or what they want. For example, sometimes people are very stuck on the rules, like we're so rigid that uh, even though this is a game predicated on uh, rules, who needs rules will make shit up. 
but some people are just so stuck on the rules that you cannot play any other way. So I would feel that the solution to a lot of these issues that we find in these RPG horror stories would be a matter of connecting these people to the right groups that want to play the way that they want to play because they understand things in similar ways. I would also add, I think something that isn't always discussed um, is the game masters themselves. I've ran across, across a lot of great game masters who argue that the story is theirs and the players mm -hmm. are playing in it. And I right. think that that's a really dangerous mindset. And my belief, the story should be everyone's, if not mm -hmm. more so the players. And I think when game masters get into, like, you know, the game itself enables a certain amount of control. However, when game masters start thinking of themselves too highly and start putting their player second, I think that's where a lot of those stories, um, like those horror stories, kick in. Because yeah. I'm a big believer the person running the table should be running the table. And part of that is making sure that, you know, if you catch someone being disrespectful, you call it out and you handle it in a cohesive and constructive manner. Um, as someone who runs a lot of games where I work with people who show up first time, have never played, and the group has never played together, I will tell you there's a huge shift in when the players respect you because they Right. I think that definitely is uh, something that people don't really talk about much is the power dynamic between like the DM and the players. You know, there is kind of like that sense of authority. You know, yeah, like, I mean, a lot of people feel they have no control over their lives. So yeah. you take a introverted person with no control over many aspects of their life, and then they come into this, and all of a sudden, they're, they are told that as the DM, they are the god of the world that they have created, and they have all these people that have to do as they say. And now it's, sometimes it's presented that way, and mm -hmm. it doesn't need to be presented in that way because that's not the case. As we've uh, said before, it is a we are telling the story and the DM is just like, you know, the intermediary, not the end all be all necessarily. Right. And I definitely agree with that. I think going back to rules, I think of the game is more people who are There's a fear that can kick in, and I think sometimes when people have that lack of control, or they're actually, they're not always trying to overcompensate, so they dive too heavy into the rules, and the rules, but I do think that inherent fear of, I'm going to be a bad DM, can very quickly become, I'm going to follow the rules exactly, and then mm -hmm. deviation, um, and then it becomes, of the system and i know like every i think it's like every generation of the rules has had these are guidelines that you can and can't use or like you can use however you want in mm -hmm. the book like that's printed in there right and i think part of the downside of rules especially in D and D, not always so much in our tabletop rpgs but the rules have played so much are so much do so much work and so concepts like character mm -hmm. creation that need for control ties into that need to not fail. And mm -hmm. as human beings, when we don't want to fail, that's where we want to control the most. Right. And unfortunately, I think that ties into everything we've been talking about, about like players and game masters. 
And I know that can happen with people who are scared to play with people, even if it's their friends. Especially with this game having such a heavy emphasis on math and public speaking. And when mm-hmm. those two ideas clash, I think that's when a lot of those horror stories kick in. Yeah. I think a lot of people, you know, they see D and D and they see how many rules there are. It can be a little intimidating too. And then they get it told, is. you know, the rules are like a guideline, you know. And they're like, Oh, okay, well, you know, I can just kind of vibe with whatever I like. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes there is sometimes there's external pressures on these things. Like yeah, in a lot of those uh, horror stories, for example, we see someone that is in the D and D in in the DM seat with all this power and control. But like we said before, that there is other aspects of this control dynamic, such as the classic trope of the the DM's girlfriend or the DM's wife wants Mm -hmm. to do something. And now they're lording something over the DM that creates a total power imbalance in the play group itself. Mm -hmm. You know, because look, I think that's, and it can definitely be harder when there's that romantic aspect, but I think it goes back into that idea of respect. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not saying that the girlfriend or the wife didn't respect their husband, but I think there's a certain level of respect that has to be had at the table. And Mm -hmm. that can definitely grow over time. But I think um, when you're talking about respect, people do confuse, like, when you call someone out on the, like, hey, please do not do this. I don't want this at my table. People get that personalization of Mm -hmm. you're calling me out as my friend telling me I messed up, so I'm now angry versus you're calling me out to keep the cohesion. I think that's one of the great drawbacks of playing with people you're really close to because there can be such a quick um, flaw in the mindset of the players and the game masters, especially if they're at odds together. Mm -hmm. Um, I've seen players uh, go off on a completely chaotic route and they actually get into an argument and fight amongst each other And I've actually seen game masters get frustrated with that and lose control of that player versus player combat. Um, And it becomes a whole mess. I think, I think especially if you're playing with like your girlfriend, your wife or whoever that you're really close to, they really could run into that. But I still think that emphasis of like respect needs to be established. So that doesn't happen. Absolutely. Like, it's very complicated because, like you said, with the emotional intelligence of the situation, having everyone learn to understand respect, like, we got respect is a very complicated thing in modern society Mm -hmm. because we uh, have had a lack of community as things have been breaking down. I mean, just look at COVID. People feel more alone more than ever before. And that leads to the more the breakdown of community. And then you have these people that are getting into the hobby after having so much time self-isolating. And this is a major thing, uh, especially amongst people of our hobby. We have a lot of nerds and a lot of nerds tend to be very introverted or neurodivergent. And these are the kind of people that don't necessarily have as many social interactions as they should. So these people with a lack of experience in respecting and understanding each other are thrust into a situation where they are at the table with other people exactly like them. Yeah. And that that's just a, it can be something beautiful or it can be a hot mess or somewhere in between. But the goal here is to try to make it as best as we can and help these people learn to do mm-hmm. these things. Like I struggle with it myself sometimes. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, I mean, I think there's, I think what you said is so true that there could be a, um, there could, it could be a hot mess or um, a, a complete success. And I think one of the key things that makes one a hot mess and one the other um, is game masters knowing how to handle conflict at a table. Um when you and I, this is something that's you know, you, I have years and years of experience doing this now. I have a lot of training 
But I will tell you, um, it is still hard, especially depending on the frustrations and things. And I'm constantly trying to develop these skills in myself. Mm-hmm. And I think I think I, one of the things that scares people off from game being a game master, being a storyteller, whatever you want to do, is that idea of what do I do when there is conflict? Like, how right. do I handle this? And then it's especially interesting because, like, in a way, as a DM, you're trying to kind of, you know, incite some for the sake of the the story and people's growth as you know character development and everything so then it's like how do i create a game conflict that's also like a personal conflict without creating like an actual conflict you know what i mean so and that like, certainly is complicated to yeah, say the yeah. least uh, i've managed to do it successfully but if I was to tell you how I did it successfully, I couldn't tell you because <laughs> some things just happen and uh, there is a subtle finesse to things, sure, but like. It's all about the, you know, like you said, the cohesion of the group and how they can work and communicate together. I do think one thing that helps a lot in my experience um, is the opportunity for players to both interact with each other in really positive situations in and outside the game. So I've done a lot of campaign sessions and like I often, I don't always do, I very rarely have ever done a six hour session, mostly because I know I'd be like dead asleep by like hour four (laughs) and then woke up at hour five. Um, but I found one of the great ways to make sure people get along, and this is definitely not always the case because mm-hmm. there are personalities that are going to take advantage of people for sure. Right. But allowing like one of my favorite things to do is have a break and in that encourage mm-hmm. and foster conversation around either what's happening in game or something that the group loves to talk about. And then I try to help people, um, you know, have as much fun with absurd situations because I found that that great unifier is laughter. Um, I love players who are willing to let me have them become the unexpected agent of chaos to a degree. (laughs) <laughs> because when you have a player you can look to and you know they've got a good sense of humor and they roll like a like one of my favorite situations was I had a player and player group of players in a underground city and like I had set up a scenario where they could activate portals to any world they wanted and it just so happened they activated a portal to the Fey world because one player tripped, accidentally pulled down another player's pants, and they had a solid five minutes of trying to scramble on the the like the portal staircase, okay. and it was just them laughing at the two players trying to get pants up and completely failing. <laughs> And then it became this whole arc in this Fey world that's now like massively moving the story. Right. And I, if I didn't have those players that were like completely accidentally being just massive agents of chaos, mm-hmm. things like that wouldn't happen. But you have to know which players you can trust. Yeah, that's very tricky. For sure. Like uh, one of the things I'm hoping to achieve with the upcoming campaign I'll be running, the uh, One Piece D&D, mm-hmm. is having things be more player driven because I've had more story driven games in the past. But I personally really enjoy when the players are the ones that are the game shakers pushing everything forward. Sure, like I, you will get like little bits here and there in games I've run in the past, but I'd like to be able to see my players have their dreams and goals and that be what pushes everything, not the, uh, oh, uh, there's a big bad, we gotta go, gotta go kill the Demon King, and 
uh, there's children lost and better go save them and all that such. I love I love that mentality. I um I'm a big I love running personally sandbox style campaigns um where players can like choose wherever they want to go. I know that's not for everyone. I've talked to many GMs that's it's too scary for them and I completely respect that. But I um as someone who does what I do, the amount of times I've like had opportunities to take little things that were complete pay- player choices and reveal like 10 sessions later that there's like take that and mold it into this great act of corruption or great plot point or even just like this little nod to something that was like a small trinket and is now like a massive part of the whole story of the campaign it's one of the things i love and i think it's i think it's a lot easier than a lot of people think it is um especially when you have the confidence in the story you're telling and you actually care about the story you're telling So Sam, what do we got for the monster yeah. this week? <laughs> yeah, yeah, these have been great discussions. So, sorry, that means I got comfortable, Mister. <laughs> so, uh, back cracks and everything. <laughs> today, today, I would like to talk about intellect devourers. Ah, I feel like Good. everyone has at least vaguely heard of. You know, flashbacks to. <laughs> I just got flashbacks to when the intellect of our killed Sheila, the the ranger snake. <laughs> that poor snake didn't stand a chance. Ah, <laughs> oh, damn. Uh, so they're like the head crabs from, uh, what is it? Half Life. Half Life. That's the one. Yeah, pretty much. It's exactly what it sounds like. It's a brain with little claw arms and legs. <laughs> and jump right up in there, uh, hollow out the skull. You got a host. It looks a little bit more than a disembodied large animal with brains that could walk on its little four bestial double jointed bony legs. Ooh, double jointed. <laughs> <Tubby talent. laughs> Though their size was variable thanks to the psionic That's a big range. That's terrifying. Have that show up in your house in the middle of the night. They were known to make like warbling noises. Oh. They, they spoke beyond them, I guess. <laughs> Something interesting I found out though. According to one ancient rumor, which was heard by the Fey Wren, a race of magically inclined Warub like aberrations. The early humans banished to the Underdark that were starving and desperate began eating anything they could find, even going as far as to consume intellect of our. Ah, flipping the script. Becoming the first native species. It is further speculated hmm. that this might be unfit to be turned back into a human. While unlikely, it was enough for a Faerun to distrust their minds for their allies at the time. Hmm. So, that's an interesting idea, too. For anyone who doesn't know, Illustrated's a lovely poet. Um, yeah, that's kind of an interesting thought. I know that they talk about a lot about how the mind Yeah, like they're dogs, you know. Um, intellect devourer is mind flayer's best friend. Yeah, for real. That's how the saying goes, right? <laughs> Something like that. Hopefully. 
the intellect devourer, as the name suggested, consumed the intelligence of sentient creatures, which could be in death or by subtle harvesting. Nevertheless, they would feed until the victim was no more than a mindless husk. Insect devourers means reproduction was understandably a mystery to most surface dwellers. In fact, illithids bred insect devourers by subjecting the brain of one of their thralls to a ritual in which the brain sprouted legs and became an independent, intelligent predator. <laughs> Just a, a ritual where the brain gets legs, okay. Oop! <laughs> The process involved immersing a brain in a spawning pool containing a glowing green brine. Magic would transmute the brain into a devourer over a few days. The process could be unreliable. The mind flayer Nihilor saw nine of sorry, nine and ten of these brains rot and die instead. Okay. So fairly well. Hey, it's starting to sound like a Lazarus pit. <laughs> yeah, kind of. The Illithids created insect devourers from the brains they elected not to eat themselves. However, it was also reported that insect devourers arose from remaining brains of creatures slain by other insect devourers. In this version, they seem to be psychic parasites spawned by the insanity of the Far Realm, and they still bore its kind of uh, tainted energy. Hmm. Interesting. So, there was also a larval form of the insect devourers called the Ustilgor, I believe is how you say it. Uh, mature insect devourers did not protect or aid them and would even eat them at times. They basically looked like brains, but instead of arms and legs, they had little tentacles. Oh, I was hoping it would be like a tadpole thing. <laughs> yeah, I think they like these are more akin to like rats or vermin. Uh, they only scavenging off the mental energies of bigger creatures and were farmed as a delicacy by elephants, unless raised to maturity. An instalagor <laughs> that consumed the brain of a psionic creature would become an adult. Oh, interesting. Huh. There's a lot more to them than I thought there would be. Yeah. A mature intellect devourer, also called intellect predator, to distinguish it from the other stages of life, operated similarly to a wolf. They hunted in packs known as pods of up to four specimens, they could also be found alone or in pairs. However, it was unusual for them to operate together like this. Rarely, an intellect, an intellect predator that lived a long time and grown massive on consumed intelligence underwent a second metamorphosis, becoming what was known as an intellect glutton, or a brain collector. Okay, that, that sounds terrifying. Too big to take a hose body, these were powerful creatures in their own way. Yeah. So... I <laughs> couldn't find anything like on these. I guess that kind of gives you the freedom to just like, what does this look like? Okay, <laughs> Ho homebrew some stuff. I could work yeah. with that. Sprinkle a couple of those bad boys in a campaign. Have like a intellect, uh, well, well, whatever the uh, the big form is that you just mentioned. Intellect uh, glutton or brain collector. Ooh, have it the size of a wonder. I almost wonder if the uh, floating brains from Futurama were loose, loosely, loosely based on that. That's very possible, because like Futurama started in the uh, late nineties, moving into the two thousands. So they that, even that would had Gary Gygax on there. So yeah, I, I remember that. <laughs> it was hilarious. I would say that if they're putting Gary Gygax on there, there's a strong chance that, you know, that there's some D&D &D influence. So, getting into the capabilities of these fuckboys. Uh, they were capable of magically consuming a humanoid creature's mind and memory from a distance of up to 10 feet, 3 meters, provided that creature had a brain and succumbed to a psychic assault. If so, the victim's mentality was deteriorated. In the worst case, the victim's intellectual capacity was completely erased, leaving them dazed or stunned, and ultimately, like, brain dead. Yeah. Psionic intellect was, devourers. Uh, yeah, that, that shit was terrifying in uh, 3.5, because oh. back then you could have your stats consumed by various creatures. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, man. That's God, bring that back. <laughs> Having your intelligence slowly sucked away. Oh my God. L literally, my greatest fear. <laughs> yeah. 
Psionic e intellective hours instead absorb mental energy as with psych psychic drain or consume the victim's confidence as with the ego. <laughs> Not my confidence. <laughs> I need that. Yeah, because I know there are some like variances of intuitive hours that will prefer to eat like specific emotions and stuff like that. Which How is... about we make a, a homebrew a variant that just devours emotional intelligence? So now all your <laughs> <laughs> now all the party members are just saying rude things to each other and being very like just insensitive. No, why would you say that? <laughs> I've got like a Futurama like conspiracy theory video running in my head, considering the oh, floating wow. brains like literally wanted to sap all intelligence from the universe and then blow it up. <laughs> it's canon. It's a thing now. <laughs> I, I, I am already gung ho. Y'all know me. I love a good conspiracy. Oh, yeah, man. Me too. So if an intellect devourer approached a vulnerable victim, it would then battle the brain's remaining defensive. A, sorry, defenses. A protection from evil spell prevented this and repelled them. Is If successful, it magically or psionically consumed the physical brain and then would teleport inside the empty skull to replace said brain, whereupon it could then use the body as a host, <laughs> such as being dominated. Naturally, this killed the victim, obviously. A fresh a fresh corpse could then be used as a host, but not undead in any other kinds of creatures, not especially hampered by the loss of a brain. Any difference in size was taken care of by their compression power. Not really sure what that means. Hmm. I wonder if you could trap one inside a corpse if you cast uh, Animate Dead on the corpse. Yeah, they teleport inside the head, so maybe not. But it's a fun thought. It is. I would imagine something like that. You have to like battle the control of the power. That could be a really fun, fun way to make your own Frankenstein monster, though. Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> Cut what its legs like... off and just slap <laughs> it in there. What if I had my my uh, soul bound character that I had, and I trap it into devour inside him. <laughs> they would just be bouncing around inside that. <laughs> There's like, no like brain for you to eat. <laughs> It'd be like Alphonse when he was hiding a puppy in there. Oh my god, you're so right. Except this puppy eats brains. <laughs> well, you know, puppies do bad things. They piss on the floor, they shit on your carpet, they eat brains. Yeah, you know, do what you gotta do. You just whack them with the newspaper until they stop eating brains. Yeah, pretty much. They eat a brain, oh. rub their nose in it. <laughs> <laughs> so once in control of the host, Insect Devourer had full control of the body, which is more or less as strong and capable as it was normally. Uh, while the Devourer retained its own mental abilities, moreover, the Insect Devourer possessed partial or complete knowledge of everything the victim knows, including all languages, uh, surface knowledge of identity and personality, but no specific memories or information. Even all their knowledge and even their spells. Uh, however, it would likely lose its knowledge once it vacated the host body. When controlling a body, the insect devourer wasn't always able to perfectly mimic the movement of certain races, such as humans. Yeah, so I would make them kind of like the zombie-like jerky movements, like no real motor control. Like that makes me think of uh, this thing I heard years ago, where. <laughs> Uh, the concept is that if a demon possesses somebody, they one of the key ways to know is they don't know how to use doorknobs correctly. Because they're they're so used oh, to no. being ethereal and just phasing through things that the moment they come across something that they can't phase through, like, what the fuck is this? And then they kind of like fumble with the doorknob. Well, I'd imagine that they know what it's like to have a physical form. Yeah, but they're not used to doorknobs. <laughs> I don't think they can. They're smart enough. They can figure it out. Like, <laughs> if you one, of my, uh, you know. <laughs> one of my all-time favorite YouTube videos is by Ryan George, and I'm pretty sure it's entitled Go Suck at Haunting People. And it's like he just breaks <laughs> down each step of how like traditional hauntings of like creaky floors and stuff are the most ghosts ever do. And like 
it's basically from the perspective of someone who's being taught like how he can haunt someone who killed him and he's just he's so frustrated he just chooses to go to the afterlife because the ghost powers are uh, you gotta watch it it's and why why are all the ghosts from like the 70s (laughs) 1700s where is all the 1990s ghosts why is nobody crip walking (laughs) in my attic (laughs) well you see the thing is the 90s ghost was attached to the rubik's cube that you tossed out oh god you're so right (laughs) <laughs> I just thought of the Rubik's Cube episode where they uh, parried, parodied Hellraiser on Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy. Oh my god, yes. I remember that! Yes! Oh, I man. love that show so much. I have got to do an, a, a DM's Guide to Netflix episode about Billy and Mandy. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to get that series fully up and on the ground because... I love the idea of deep diving into shows that are perfect inspiration material for DMing. Billy and Mandy <laughs> topped here for sure. Oh, the Cthulhu episode um, where it's just Cthulhu prank calling people across the multiverse. That's like, <laughs> that's like peak television of any that era. so good, man. <laughs> it was. And it really flips the script. I mean, think about it. Everyone uh, talks about, oh, we're going to prank call the the big bad with sending. Okay, but what about when the big bad is prank calling you with sending? Like, he knows you're out there. He He's knows you're doing nightmares. shit. Like, <laughs> no, no, he, he just sending me like, hey, just I'm just here to let you know that you're not good enough. I mean, your friends probably told you already, but I thought you should hear it from me. <laughs> <laughs> just on a regular basis just constantly heckling you, and hazing them at every a couple times a day what if you had like the big gonna, bad impersonate like a cleric's deity I've got to <laughs> see Hel- Hoss Delgado fight an army of these elective <laughs> hours now that would be oh the my thing god ever. he has no brain for them to take it's fine <laughs> Oh my god. That's I'm writing down that sending like that. harassment thing. <laughs> <laughs> so before I get into their abilities and stuff here, finish this up. Safely ensconded inside the host's body, it cannot be easily attacked or targeted. It can only be removed by protection from evil and good. However, this process killed the host's body unless the original brain was somehow restored within a few seconds. Alternatively, a wish spell could restore the host's brain, forcing it to forcing the devourer out if the host body was killed or the devourer was forced to leave by some means it then teleported to a place five feet 1.5 meters away an infect devourer could also leave willingly by exploding out of the skull (laughs) (laughs) that's terrifying (laughs) otherwise if not exposed it could apparently control the body indefinitely though some accounts suggested seven days before needing to refresh I just imagine some intellect of our just uh, taking the body of just some average dude, like a baker or like a just an accountant, and he just yeah. going into work every day. They're going home to the wife, and kids, <laughs> living the life. It's just I do not vibe with this reality. <laughs> <laughs> the horrified expressions at the dinner table. Oh my god! Well, getting into their stats here. Only being a CR two, these things got some got some merit. These are if if anyone is familiar with like SCP, these aren't XK class like breach scenario. <laughs> the world could end if these get out of control. Okay, <laughs> oh, you have a whole bunch of them. Just uh, a hive you know. of insect devourers. Oh, <laughs> ooh, that's good. You could have a like hive mind. You, you could that's have it. like. The the what is it called the the brain collector or whatever be like the town chief or whatever, and everybody is like infected with infective hours. That's horrifying. Maybe they just make everyone feel really insecure. <laughs> Eat your party walks in. Everybody's fucking weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. They just go it. from town to town, just. Uh, consuming everybody's confidence until you have just a bunch of really anxious, high-strung, <laughs> insecure people. 
And they I come think in. We have to have like a supplement them. of like Hostel Gato and Billy and Mandy D and D game where you're just playing as those characters walking into that exact I mean, setting. Oh, I need Tulak the Barbarian. It. If if anyone can get in touch with him, uh, get him to make Hostel Gato in D and D, please. <laughs> Assuming he hasn't already, uh, he's Has got he? hun- I don't oh know. He's God. got hundreds, oh, hundreds of these things, and it's December, so he's gonna. Well, almost December. So in every December, Tulak goes through the process of every day is a build. So he's gonna have like, and it's it if he doesn't have Hostel Gato already, there's a very good likelihood <laughs> that we're gonna see Hostel Gato in the next month. It has not been done. <laughs> the opportunity. <laughs> Arguably better, Billy oh. playing as Billy in that setting, <laughs> just like the immortal child who never can make like a one him. shot was just like Billy, Mandy, Grim, Han Delgado. <laughs> it could be uh, done. It could be done. Not everybody's <laughs> born cool, except Han Delgado. <laughs> oh my god, he's an artificer because he. <laughs> Uh, all right. So they have a strength of six, weak boys, dexterity of 14, constitution of 13, intelligence of 12, wisdom of 11, and a charisma of 10. Okay. So I have to know, Sam, yes. middle of the night, you hear a bump. <laughs> you, you go upstairs and you see an intellect devourer in your home on a scale of one to 10. Can you beat it? All right, hold on, hold on. So I'm gonna <laughs> over the, the stats real quick. See what we're working with here, or not? That's the abilities. We got the tech sentience. Uh, Intellect devourer can sense the presence and location of any creature within 300 feet that has an intelligence of three or higher. All right, so it knows everybody in your house, assuming you know <laughs> you got like at least a baby above like three. <laughs> Or like a dog or something, you know? It knows everybody that's in there. Not the dog! <laughs> Dogs are smarter, though. The Intellect Devourer has a... Uh, oh, can target one creature, can see within 10 feet. So, okay, so once you go upstairs, right? You walk up there, as soon as you see it, it's already trying to suck you, you know what I mean? So you gotta make that save, the DC-12 Intelligence save, or take some psychic damage. Yep. I just looked it up. Dogs are indeed smart enough. <laughs> yeah. You know, it kind of it kind of depends because then, you know, this is when you start taking damage. And when you go down is when it's going to, you know what I mean? So how long or can you resist the the mental combat? You know what I mean? Me personally, oh. I got some mental fortitude. You know, I'm at least taking two saves. You know what I mean? Well, and then that, that depends. health is pretty low. <laughs> uh, I, I, th- I think so. Uh, I guess in the in the in the sense of mental fortitude, are you like putting up a a mental barrier? Like, what is your mental barrier to well, repel psychic attacks? You know. Well, there's there's like the the natural. You know, you would feel it. Maybe like a headache would start setting in. Whatever, I brush that off. You know what I mean? As soon as I see it, I'm like, oh hell, <laughs> this thing gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> so like. I'm closing the distance. It doesn't seem that fat. I mean, that's a speed of 40 feet, dexterity of 14. It's probably about, you know, it's about like, equal. It's like, like catching person. a cat. Yeah, yeah. Or a dog. You know? Yeah, yeah. it'd be like catching probably a dog. I think it could be done. <laughs> <laughs> if I if I catch it, you know, I kind of keep this as the same rules of like animals, right? If I can pick you up and catch you, you're done. <laughs> <laughs> There's no neck to snap. How are you killing this thing? You're just like, he's going to bash it in. I'm going to grab it by the leg. I'm going to slam it. And I'm stomping that bad boy out. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> how, how about you, Thomas? Uh, intellect devourer <laughs> breaks into your apartment in the middle of the night. Well, what That's do you do? Thing. Like, it's not going to let you like, um, find it. It's, I, I need to, like, like line to say of sight, right? Billy, but so I think like, I'm hopefully smarter than that. Um. Huh. I don't know. Um, I think, honestly, I would probably just run. 
He's like, either thinking as really fast hard as or has disconnected. I don't want. I don't want to deal with it. I don't. Like oh, he has disconnected. Anyways. Oh no. <laughs> no, no, he's there. I don't think that I. No, I could disconnected. Stick around in that. At least in the lips. No, the, Sam, the Libsyn's fine. I, I will take a screenshot for you right now. <laughs> Everything's good on my side, bud. You hear it? Yeah. I don't hear anything. Um, like. It did sound like only uh, from I me. couldn't hear for a bit. <laughs> yeah, it might have been just a brief thing. Okay. Now he's, well, maybe I'll have to reconnect in one second. I'll show okay. you this screenshot. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need. I believe you, Sam. It's just uh, nah, 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 nah. The <laughs> yeah. I still can't hear Sam. Okay, so okay, so you two can't hear each other. So Sam's gonna rejoin here. Okay. Uh, I get. Okay, there we go. There. Yeah, there we go. There awesome. we go. That, that was strange. It was very strange. But yeah, like you were saying. <laughs> Sorry, <it's> like... <laughs> no, I'm good. What was uh, what was his answer? Can you take one? Oh, uh, I just he, he would I wouldn't even risk it. Because <laughs> <laughs> this is I... my problem. I feel like if you run from it, man, you got as soon as you see it, you gotta like. <laughs> <laughs> like it's a moral responsibility. Yeah, because like, what's the alternative? Like, you run away and it sucks you from a distance. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> like a long distance girlfriend. If only. <laughs> <laughs> well, th this is an emotional sucking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Takes your confidence. <laughs> <laughs> well, what about you, Orion? You think you could take it? Hell yeah, I could take it. I'm going to give this thing a, a 2 out of 10 on the IRL fight score. 2 because it has the chance to get the jump on me. But yeah, here's yeah. the thing, Sam. I I'm a light sleeper. So yeah. if something starts uh, r rustling around the house, I I'm up like that. Because, you know, I got those daddy pr parental reflexes. And if we got something like this hiding around, I'm going to probably hear it maybe just kind of like walk around and then once i uh, get that thing in my sight bam maybe, maybe i throw something at it because i i like to throw things and you know got all this uh, pent-up aggression where i just gotta i gotta throw shit and then if i actually catch it that's not that's the that's the big thing because how dare something try to take my intelligence I, I i like my thinking i like to think that i can do a thought or two yeah, I only got so many brain cells to work with. Come on. <laughs> you okay, Sam? Uh, it looks like he's fixing his audio I'm there. sneezing. <laughs> ah! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, I, I definitely good, think I could take one of these. Uh, body slam it. <laughs> just oh, stomp yeah. on it. Uh, just smack it with a fire extinguisher. <laughs> That's the thing. They would try to get you while you're sleeping, right? They would be like up in your rafters or whatever. Oh, shit. It could try to corrupt my dreams. I don't care. You see, like, <laughs> if I have bad dreams, I have this thing I do where I wake up and try again. <laughs> so you wake up and you fight the dream. <laughs> I, I, so <laughs> let's say it's like kind of do that mind suck while I'm sleeping and that messes with the dreams. Okay, I wake myself up. Something's not right here. And then I'm like, well, I mean, mm. because also you're you'd be taking damage right while you're asleep. So ideally, that would wake you up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I would hope so. But I like yeah. to think that I I would wake up. Yeah. See, I I wonder, like, oh, sorry, you were gonna say something? Oh, I was gonna say like th I'm not someone who likes rodents, and I feel like this would be like. 10,000 times worse than waking yeah. up to a rat in my bed. Oh my god, yeah. <laughs> so you just wake I up with it on your chest? <laughs> if I saw yeah. that, I might as There's well jump out the chest. window and risk that just instead of dealing with something that can do that. Especially if like it's a good-sized one. Like, that's... Yeah. Plus, it'd be like the worst Christmas present ever for it to burst out of my head. <laughs> Like, in oh front of my people. God. 
<laughs> that, you would just be sitting there Christmas. and like but that's the thing because like you would you would see it there'd be that initial like check right it tries to take some intelligence from you assuming it succeeds you get a little bit dumber maybe you're like what am i what do i do like what am i doing or well, you know well, something. the smarter you are the more intelligence yeah. it has to take first so that's yeah. already like you know you're you know, already maybe off like, to a good start <laughs> yeah maybe you're like oh i can't remember what i was you know doing before this and you see it again and you're like what the hell is that <laughs> i i would just be the the concept that this thing is trying to take my intelligence would send me into an yeah. absolute rage yeah <laughs> yeah the first like first time i feel it try to do anything i'm like oh you motherfucker <laughs> oh you little piece of shit yeah i almost i almost feel like the loss of confidence would be worse because i oh, feel like God, the logic yeah. of scary thing hit it with rock until it doesn't move is probably yeah. like, does not take a lot of intelligence yeah, that's a, that's more of like an Absolutely. instinctual reaction, right? But if you don't have that confidence to where like you don't think you can take it, then you're gonna instinct is gonna run. It's gonna be like, oh, I'm gonna chase this boy and get him from a distance, and I'm getting it anyway. See, if I'm not confident, I'm gonna throw shit, and that's possibly <laughs> worse. <laughs> For me, worst case scenario is it saps my confidence until I can't leave the room. And then I'm just stuck with it without the intelligence so... to know what to do. Oh, God. It makes you so stupid you, like, forget how to walk. <laughs> <You're> just... <laughs> at, at that point, your options are return to monkey or, or die. <laughs> Let the monkey lizard brain take over. <laughs> That's another thing. I feel like no matter how, you know, how much intelligence it takes from you until you're dead, your instinctual reaction is like, this thing is hurting me. Like, or something is hurting me. Like, uh, yeah, monkey absolutely. brain, get rid of whatever hurt. <laughs> See no weird hurt. creature, kill. Get rid of. I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be my reaction. I would see it and be like, is that a brain with legs? Oh, nah, you gotta go. <laughs> like, yeah, like, I've seen wrong. the Ninja Turtles. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> fucking with this one. I'm not about this to find out. Abomination. You deserve to be killed. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. All I don't right. know what number I would give it. Maybe like a four. <laughs> yeah. It, like it would have to get the jump on you, and yeah. it would have to be a very good jumping. Yeah, I, it'd have to succeed on the first save, I think. Yeah, it, you get one shot. Yeah, <laughs> I think it would be then, really interesting to talk to the D and D player who would want this thing as a pet. But the, the can, terrifying implications yeah. of a party utilizing one of these as a pet. Oh god, that's even more. you like capture an enemy, you like let this thing take its brain. Now you got this thing as a companion. That's horrifying. You gotta feed your pet. You find an oh enemy spellcaster, you pop I mean, that bad boy in there. Uh, look, we've talked about having like mimic mimic as companions. This is essentially that, right? Like Yeah, it, it worse, actually. These are smart enough to where you could probably reason with it and convince it to not can Assume you and just let it like work with you. Maybe we'll give you know. an endless supply of bodies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't kill us, but we'll help you feed and grow. <laughs> you know, a part of me almost wants to see like someone do fan art of just like a D and D party with a pack of these things and like Christmas card oh. like, <laughs> and stuff. It just gave me the ick. <laughs> I'm just picturing like a montage. Where over oh, the party and the little intellect and devour and it's all like, let me tell you about my best friend. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> you have a ranger and this is their like bonded companion. I was bonded six by me to the end. Let Jesus me Christ. tell you about my best friend. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, oh, that'd be that's crazy. my monster for today. That I talk about, you know, world ending scenario. Let's talk about like the worst case, right? Like the the brain collector thing happens. There's like a hive mind, 
they start taking over cities. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. That, that would awesome. escalate so quickly. That worked. You know, I watched Hulu too. I watched the the Suicide Squad movie recently and they had those like starfish head crab things. Oh uh, yeah. Essentially the same thing, right? Like basically. Yeah. That, well, was that is though? an existential threat to humanity at that point. Yeah. I'm kind of surprised they went with Starro just because depending yeah, on the comic right. you read, like he's like either world ending to galaxy like ending threat yeah. versus I haven't seen the whole movie, but I've been killed on on a ton of it. And the I fact that it was like <laughs> it, it's so bizarre, kind of um, the concept of these galaxy ending threats being stopped by a yeah. bunch of people with rats. Me. <laughs> I mean, Squirrel Girl stopped Thanos, I guess. <laughs> I mean, I feel like that comic though that makes so much more sense. I mean, I have heard. Like apparently they they think like the Sentry is gonna be in, um, oh yeah, the, like the Marvel movie version of the Suicide Squad, and yeah. that guy is basically Superman for Marvel. So I don't know how that's gonna yeah. go. It's the same with like uh, with like Adam Warlock, or whatever. He's supposedly like really strong. Like yeah, Warlock. Adam Warlock is stupid strong, and then he got so downplayed in that. A Galaxy Guardians of the Galaxy movie. I, I was upset with how much he was downplayed. Marvel has really lost their touch. They just downplay the stuff. That's why if you want to see uh, Adam Warlock in any kind of uh, film-esque uh, situation, just check out the Guardians of the Galaxy animated TV show. Yeah, that was pretty good. Uh, I really enjoyed it thoroughly. So, Ryan, I'm wondering, do we have any news for this week? Oh, yes, we do. This is TNN, bringing you nerd news. Yes, Uh, we got some news this week, Sam. So uh, I'm going to start things off with, uh, you know, least interesting, but, you know, it it mildly interesting. Chris Mm. Pine, the guy that played in the D&D movie, he says he's pretty confident in a sequel film. Now, I would like to see a sequel film. I personally liked the movie. I thought it was fun. You know? It was a good little romp of a movie. You, Ooh, you don't get enough of those nowadays. Oh, Chris Pine. Yeah, this is that guy. Um, James T. Kirk. Star Trek. Yeah, yeah. He, he played the... Yeah. Yeah, he played the bard in this one. And I'm just like, okay, cool, cool. I, I'm personally down for such a thing because... The movie was fun to me, but I, I but there it. is a, I have a one major concern with that. Uh, I think Wizards is probably going to run out of money before they can even produce a second film. Yeah, I don't think it did well enough to be like, yeah, it's a definite sequel, but I mean, it could happen. I think. Well, let's see. It grossed $208.2 million against its 150 million budget. So it's not the worst. Uh mixed ratings. Uh, the thing is it was rolled out during the height of the OGL and <laughs> that kind of that kneecapped it hard. Yeah, they tried to like coordinate that. Like, oh, you guys, OGL, and then this movie, but then they bombed the OGL. <laughs> uh, speaking of Wizards bombing, uh, well, I'll, I'll move into the, the next thing that Wizards has <laughs> fucked up on because WotC has a long history of doing that that spans this year. <laughs> Talked about many times. Yeah, many times, like the deck of many things which they have delayed that won't be home for the holidays. So anyone that was planning on doing using the new deck of many things, I uh, think they were putting out. Well, don't expect that this Christmas season because that's going to be pushed back to January. What were they, uh, what were they, doing? Uh, they had, oh, no. well, the uh, deck of many uh, things was supposed to be this, uh, big like they were really revamping it and having it all based around the uh the 
item in game, the deck of many mm-hmm. things. Right. So like, oh, they're gonna make a physical deck. Uh, and, and then some, because it, it looks like uh, many. So it says here that many of the fans who paid the ninety nine dollar uh price tag on the supplement hoped it would r- arrive before the holiday season, given the initial launch around October thirty first, and with a fairly quick response from Wizards of the Coast. A statement on November 20th by the publisher dashed those hopes. Okay, so uh, it's more of a supplement that mm-hmm. goes beyond the simple deck of many things. $99? Yeah, what the fuck? Y'all are losing the plot if you're pricing things at that, but actually, I, I don't know if I can necessarily say that. I go to the store nowadays, and when I buy stuff, like basic things like food or toilet paper, uh, the prices are all over the place. I don't know what a good deal looks like, Sam. Yeah, I, I, I have no idea, man. Everything is so high. Like, like they really like. <laughs> oh man, I don't know. You're like, I, I think that sounds good. <laughs> I, I look at things. I'm like, uh, it's is that a good deal? Like, does Question. Even do like Black Friday or shit? Like, that- uh, uh, we kind of did in the sense that we got a discount when we were uh, springing for the foundry vtt that we'll be using in the upcoming campaign so oh. yeah ten dollars off you got a discount? Nice. oh yeah i i thought i mentioned that you did not. oh hmm. that explains how we got it then. yeah <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. And, then moving on to the next uh, little tidbit of news we got here Adventure Time R- the Adventure Time RPG punts its new yes and system in favor of D&D 5e rules which a, a lot of people are disappointed by this because the concept of Adventure Time is very it's whimsical kind of free form not as number crunchy as your typical RPG should be you know what i mean mm. Yeah but i don't see how this could like heard it you know i I think it's just weird because like uh, Mm -hmm. they were so when they were launching this kickstarter they were really Mm gung-ho to have their hey yes and system like Mm -hmm. being able to have people come up with ideas on the spot and just roll with it right right like that's a very specific start uh, to uh, how they wanted to pitch their rules but now they've just kind of re uh they're rebranding, they're kind of changing things up so it's more akin to 5th edition and diving more and more into those kind of rules. And I'm not necessarily opposed because I am a big Adventure Time fan. If I could have things more within the lines of a system that I'm familiar with, cool, yeah, but it's... probably what it is, I think. Yeah, uh, I just think it's a shame that they weren't being their own thing, you know? I mean, yeah, maybe they just got, you know difficult to kind of come up with as a, as a new concept you know well I, for, hmm. I could see the, some of the things in Adventure Time being very tricky to handle without using like the D&D 5e system you know I would also I think, think in- that um, with the people who have worked on Adventure Time they're probably going to have a lot of really unique ideas that they may not have even yeah. discussed yet Especially just, like, based on the wild success and popularity of the Fiona and Cake TV show and how good that was. I feel like they're not the kind of people to go cash grabby in a lot of ways. Right. Yeah. I I feel like this is more of a... After... I think this change coming after the Fiona and Cake, because Adventure Time they've been talking about this long before the Fiona and cake launch. So maybe you're right. Maybe that is what influenced this whole situation. Cause Fiona and cake being very narrative driven. It's also like, a, it does seem like there would be a decent amount of mechanics watching things and seeing how they play out. Yeah. And they've kind of strayed away in this right here from being a narrative focused to having more of a numbers structure. Mm-hmm. And I'm also wondering, maybe they wanted to add in some maturity as well, like some deeper concepts that they 
maybe couldn't have gotten away with before Fiona and Cake as well, considering that was way more adult oriented in its language and how it handled certain things than Adventure Time was ever blatantly about. I mean, it, it's a super complex show, but there were a lot of things they were not allowed to outright do and say. Yeah. And they, they, they definitely like skirted the line. And with Fiona and Cake, they've shown a lot more, you know, of the deeper lore stuff that they really couldn't touch on in Adventure Time. And well, let's see. I'm looking a little just... bit more into the uh, article here from Dicebreaker. It yeah. says that when last we checked on the upcoming uh, tabletop RPG set in the land of Ooh, players uh, would use a newly designed yes and rule set designed by Forever Stoked and its creative director, uh, Matt uh, Fantastic, hooked up for the, specifically for this project. You can read a deep dive. And, okay, yeah. So they got a link to another thing here. The, the gist of that is that the the con like your your dice rolls would be res- resolved with a pool of custom uh, dice marked with yes, no, and but and blank die faces. So you roll the die to interpret mm-hmm. the results and keep the story moving forward. So okay, okay. I, I kind of like that concept. And mm-hmm. even if they ditch that concept, I would say that in certain situations that might be fun to incorporate yeah. into your home games just as is I yeah i mean that's something that could help just with like role play you know i also wonder if they were scared about like we were talking about earlier creating more unnecessary tabletop role playing game horror stories maybe they thought yeah. their system would do more harm than good the way it was i could see that yeah uh, it's, there's a quote in here yes we made the decision to make it a 5e experience based on feedback from fans that doesn't mean the game uh, shown at gen con early this year won't be released too but the main mm-hmm. offering in the upcoming kickstarter will be the 5e rpg okay so it's not gone it's just you're getting both uh, that's even yeah, better yeah. You're yeah, that's really exciting. burying the lead dice breaker. Shame on you. <laughs> I'm tired I, of people burying love, the lead like that. I would love for us to to play some of these, you know, new things and like make them videos or streams or something. Yeah, that's why I was talking about uh, doing things on a biweekly basis for our regular uh, campaign and then fitting uh, things in between on the mm-hmm. off weeks. Yeah, for sure. We could, uh, I don't know if we have any listeners out there who are doing their own games, want to invite us or you know, want to join in some of ours. Let us know. That'd be awesome. And let's see, moving on to the final bit of news here. Mm-hmm. Last one, I, I promise, guys. <laughs> it, it just, it, there was a lot this week. So apparently, uh, Wizards of the Coast's uh, core uh, book sensitivity and inclusivity changes are being implemented into uh, the updates for the new books. Oh, yeah, that's fun. <laughs> I did hear about this <laughs> vaguely. Yeah. I mean, whatever makes people comfortable, I guess. Okay, I but you, you say that, but let's uh, look at some of the passages that they're changing in the, let's say, the DMG. All right. Okay, uh, right here. Where they confront, uh, the original says, where they confront savage giants. Ferocious Hydra, okay, whatever. Mm-hmm. And the, they're changing savage to brutal. So so any mention of the word savage is being removed from the game. Why? I don't know. Who like, are you what? offending by calling someone a savage? <laughs> like, you savage know, is could... innately supposed to be an insult. <laughs> like, <laughs> I actually... I can see that one just because of the native population and like people connected to tribe from like eons ago, like the surprising amount of conversations I have with people where they still hear the word savage um, and like the negative connotation. And I almost wonder if that is just, it may be a bit of an overcorrection, but I wonder if they are working really hard not to be dated to like old school movies where Savage was yeah. really poorly handled. 
I mean, that's I, probably I the don't case. Know, cause like a, but, oh, you were going to say, Sam? Oh, oh yeah. I, I was just going to say, like, when you talk about somebody being like a savage, right? It's a very specific idea that you're trying to put across, right? It's not like like beyond oh, these brutality. Are savage. Yeah, it's it's more it's deeper than that, right? It's like they do things that are specifically savage. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> it's it's like a deeper. Yeah, like if if you describe brutal, I, I imagine like okay, big buff dude punches someone so fucking hard they they lose teeth blood's going everywhere and like you can hear bones and stuff crack under their fist but if you tell me that someone was savagely attacked i'm thinking this person wasn't that didn't just happen on top of that they were taken to the ground they were beaten uh, savagely there's, you know they're yeah, just like there's also the, the 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 implication of like the the bestial nature of things when you use things like savage you know, because it's kind of like you use things that are what's 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 the word I'm looking for here? Like, you know, when they do talk about like barbarians and like orcs and stuff, right? They're an uncivilized. Uh, 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 like, don't don't beat me to it, because that's yeah. all those words you just said are coming up next. Yeah, yeah, it's. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, well, I, 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 I don't th- no, know if I necessarily have any room to speak on it, being I'm only 30% Native American and <laughs> and have but some affiliation with like the Mi'kmaq even, tribe in, here in Maine. But, like, it's just... Because you, I, can, you could be, like, an isolated tribe or an isolated civilization, you know what I mean, without being savages. Like, you don't have to, you know, have that connection. I always see it as savage is more, like, you're describing something that is just beyond primal. Like it's yeah. just that kind of rough and uncut. The disregard for like, you know, people or, you know, yeah, living like, things or whatever. Like, Yeah. Like it, right here, the next one, it says uh, monstrous predators and savage raiders being a change to monstrous predators and merciless raiders. Those two, like if you swap that word right there, that, that completely Why changes. Why they been monstrous, huh? <laughs> Might as well change everything. <laughs> uh, the next one we got here that's changed from from fight sav. You can can expect to fight savage orcs to fight ruthless bandits. So why are they getting rid of orcs? <laughs> <laughs> Is it an in? Who am I offending by saying orc? Are orcs not bandits sometimes? Can orcs not to be bandits? Orcs can be bandits, but not all bandits are orcs. <laughs> yeah. <I> think, <laughs> what are they trying of, to say? <laughs> I think part of the inherent issue with something like this is, you know, I'm I can't speak for everyone. I can't talk on every situation. But I feel like when there is an urgency to replace words without an intentionality like a very specific intentionality with it, it's going to frustrate someone in some way. And I feel like, especially with the changing of language and a lot of things, there are a lot of people who they work too hard to change things, but they don't always put in the effort to necessarily, and I can't speak for Watsi. I don't know what their whole system is behind the thing, but I think sometimes when we, like when we go to fix something, that doesn't work for some people and doesn't work for others. There's always that danger of ruining it more. And I think that's mm. for something that's as established as D and D, especially with the wide variety of people in the fan base. I think one of the dangers is um, if you don't have enough people from those communities commenting, the danger is ruining it by actually sacrificing the intentionality. If that makes sense. Mm. I yeah. absolutely agree because that does make a sense. Uh, yeah. Look at this uh, at let's say uh, a ship of Theseus perspective. If you <laughs> keep swapping out each and every piece of this ship that is D and D, so yeah. uh, we start with replacing savage with brutal. Uh, we uh, start replacing, uh, you know, uh, race with species like uh, honestly a lot of people accepted race with species because that you know that one 
that made some sense, you know? Yeah, uh, I could I could be okay with that. I didn't like it, but it made sense. Yeah. So we keep chipping away at these little things, little by little. So instead of saying the word civilized lands, we're saying settled lands. Like, what's wrong with civilization? Who are you? Aff- who is this for? <laughs> Just because a land is settled doesn't mean they're civilized. Yeah, like, uh, here's a one from the player's handbook. Uh, adventurers heading back to their civilization to rest. Uh, to adventurers heading back to their home base to rest. Like, what's wrong with heading back to civilization? You're out in the, home base. You're, you're out in the wild. You go back to, you, you know, civilized places like towns. <laughs> a fierce warrior of a primitive background to, to just a, a fierce warrior who can uh, just... Just they took out of primitive, primitive background. Like, what's wrong with saying our our barbarian? It's literally the class. Like barbarians are meant to be brutes. Or, or like, like that'd be like saying druids or like I don't know. They strictly are. They don't. Mean, uh, like... They're trying to remove other words in, in magic where it's just like you can't use the word witch, or or uh, priest. <laughs> or like they're going out of their way to remove these things. It's just like, I was raised by Wiccans, dude. Nobody's offended by you using the word witch. It's just like, if you're, if you're going to take out a witch, you have to say, well, like demon, devil, or like, <laughs> <laughs> like right here, it's a, it says a barbarian horde. And then it's, re- that's replaced with an invading horde. <laughs> like, uh, I'm not afraid of an invading horde nearly as much as a barbarian horde. <laughs> yeah, that's a different inclination. Implication too. Like... I almost wonder. <laughs> I almost wonder if it would have been better for them if they had like done a directory of words you can use, and like giving variations. Because I feel like choosing. I feel like choosing the like just one word for all scenarios is kind of shooting themselves in the foot a bit. Yeah, it it gets weirder as it, dude. It gets even weirder the deeper down I'm going into this article, showing the comparison because it. I read through some of it earlier, and it kind of seems like they're conflating madness, insanity. And stuff of that nature with mental health. And it's like, okay, well, just because something is mad or insane doesn't mean that we're being hateful towards people that have mental issues. Like, there's tons of people that seek out mental health all the time. And just because someone has a a disability or a, a illness that's affecting them, it doesn't mean that we think less, like, it's like, hey, come on, like, just because you have to take pills to kind of cope with maybe something like bipolar doesn't mean that you are, you know, the kind of person that's being offended by saying mad necromancer yeah. or or pandemonium is the plane of madness. Exactly. I mean, I work to try to keep my phrasing wise and I work with the mental health community but I've, I've used the word insanity check. I've used, you know, realm of madness. It goes back to that. How do you use it? And how do you use it in kind communication? Yeah. I mean, I think the thing is, I don't think coddling people within the mental health community is helping them in any way. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, like uh, replacing the word crazy with foolhardy. Foolhardy and crazy are very different. Those are very different things when you're describing an enemy. A crazy enemy means that this person ha- has lost themselves. They, 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 they have something went wrong. Foolhardy means, oh, well, you know, they're just a little misguided. This is the difference they're between just, like the Riddler and the Joker. 
right? Like, <laughs> yes, that it is that difference. That crazy and foolhardy is literally the difference between <laughs> the Riddler and the Joker. Uh, another one here is describing a wizard, an insane wizard, yeah. or a villainous wizard. Like, those are two different connotations. An insane wizard is just like, okay, this person, something <laughs> happened to them in oh, their life, worse. and it broke them in some way that can that's that it could very well be irreparable yeah, right and the, your players might approach a insane wizard with either hostility or levels of compassion but if you're approaching a villainous wizard that's they're a bad guy right off the bat It it do, it gets even weirder. So uh, this one it talks about a a herald, a town crier, a mad person, or other individual. That, that's the old uh, reading. Uh, the new one is herald, a town crier, a prophet, or another individual. It's like, are you conflating madness with prophecy? <laughs> this is worse. <laughs> uh, then under that. Uh, the uh, change is from mad woman to sooth soothsayer. I don't know about That's... you, but every crazy ex I have is not a soothsayer. They are not predicting the future. Yeah, and that's like a very specific like for someone to be a soothsayer is like it's not a bad thing. They're not insane. They're just they got their own kind of magic. Like well, sometimes you see things that others don't, and yeah, that's kind of an iconic thing that you find in a lot of games. You know. Like, just, this person seems a little unhinged, but they, they can see beyond the veil. And, of course, that would affect your mental state, seeing oh, things that are beyond human comprehension. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> uh, Wizards is doing questionable things once again. <laughs> uh, from changing the writings of raving lunatics to the incomprehensible scrawlings of witnesses. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> They, I didn't realize witnesses had trouble writing. <laughs> Good thing I'm not a cop. I almost wonder if... So there's, a, there's some things I can understand, some things I can't. And I almost wonder if they're revealing their hand quite a bit um, in some of their mind of... Like, what they're attempting to put is mindfulness. Because... There definitely seems to be almost a political like aspect to some of the things like with Soothsayer. Um and it seems like it seems like they are getting guidance that is flawed in a lot of ways. Yeah. Uh, like it's one of those things where before you change something, you need to understand what they're what you're changing. And it seems to me that they outsource this to a one of those uh, DEI uh, agencies that does the book reading and they review things in books and check to make sure that everything is, you know, PC and friendly for all audiences. Now, if you are outsourcing to a agency like that, that means you have an outsider looking in at all of these things and mm -hmm. they don't understand what they're looking at to begin with. But for example, let me uh, scroll down a little bit to some of the other uh, terms that they're trying to uh, get rid of. Uh, references to fat have been either removed uh, when the word does not add meaning or revised to a better way to explain the creature's size. We can't call something fat now? <laughs> I mean, if a creature's fat, I'm calling it fat, bro. Like, <laughs> I'm uh, here sorry, like... Uh, the conflation of Asian and honor. Okay, so uh, they have seen, so for the 2024 rules, they're going to change how monks are characterized by removing mention of key. Oh. What? They're removing key? I like ah! key! It's like their whole thing. I went through a whole stint when I was in high school practicing key gong. You're, you're... <laughs> like, come on. No, they can't do that. That's the same thing. <laughs> like Marshall energy. What the hell? Um, 
Let's see. Phylactery, they're going to remove phylacteries from liches because it what? is of Jewish cultural origin. What? What? I don't know. I'm not Jewish either. I mean, a bar mitzvah would be fun. I mean, lift me up on a chair and dance me around. That sounds awesome. I'm looking this up. I'm mostly jealous because no one ever uh, came up to me and told me, Orion, you are now a man. Okay, yes, vaguely. So they're, they're called tefillin or phylacteries are a set of small black leather boxes with leather straps containing scrolls of parchment inscribed with verses from the Torah. They're worn by adult Jews during weekday and Sunday morning prayers. That's not even the same. I mean, just because like they're called phylacteries, it's like they're not even the same thing. And phylacteries for a list oh, can be anything. Like that doesn't make sense. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I expected the gender stuff because that's mentioned here in the article. It's like, okay, well, that makes sense. Tons of people in the hobby are uh, trans or non-binary or other. You know, like there's mm -hmm. tons of people within the hobby, so of course that's going to be something like that makes sense. I, I get it. Yeah, for sure, for sure. But other things here are just unasked for. And this then as, at the very end of all of the, the, as far as I got the page loaded here. Oh, no, I guess uh, <laughs> it goes further. But yeah, give us one more. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll leave us with one more on here because this this thing just go. I'll probably put the link in the description afterwards mm. if anyone wants to read it for themselves. But uh, we'll end things off with slavery. Oh, uh, yeah, they want to get rid of uh, slavery from as a, uh, as a whole concept. Yeah, but yeah. what if my, what if my dude like uh, uh, for me like sure uh, it, it's not a fun concept, but moving That's into the campaign the that we're going into, uh, one of the driving factors is that slavery is a thing in the world, and yeah. a lot of the players are not okay with that, so they want to kill slavers and free the slaves. And I mean, what does that mean for a lot of races who have like slavery be a big part of their, you know, race history? Like, like drow? Like drow, dragonborn, you know? You got like kobolds, goblins, all of them, really. I will like, say one, I, I don't agree with it totally, but one thing I could possibly reason they were trying to avoid um, with that is like encouraging the trope yeah. of like your player character being completely racist against another species yeah and, like, being the that. slave owner and i'll be honest i don't allow that in my games partly because yeah, i've seen that works. go really south and yeah. i feel like that's such like, a specific like game yeah. by case like yeah case. like if you're going to engage in slavery in your game, like that's a very particular table that you're sitting at, you know, because yeah. some people are cool with it and they think, hey, OK, hey, it's funny. Uh, this world has slaves. Or we'll make the slaves do funny things. But yeah. in most cases throughout all of history, like uh, if you work at look at real world slavery, every race on ever just almost every continent has been enslaved in some capacity. Yeah. And like in D and D, that's basically the same. The tons and tons of different races have been enslaved by one another back and forth. Mm -hmm. And I think that by removing slavery, you're removing the chance for people to fight it. Yeah, I would do you, you remove the like the adversity from the game? Like that'd be like removing like murder, like. Yeah, like you can't kill anything. Sorry, guys. It, it, <laughs> like, <laughs> where there is a power, there's going to be people who are going to be oppressed, right? So it's like, you can't make it so that people can't enslave people now. I mean, like, there's always going to be someone who wants to oppress the people below them. Yeah, like, I, there are touchy topics for the game, absolutely. Like, uh, mm -hmm. rape, for example. Like, that's... Yeah, I mean, like, that could happen at a table if uh, if players are okay with whatever the context is and you're not being too graphic like an asshole. Like, right. in my case, I think most of my players would be happy to... Uh, 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 like, everyone's like, hey, I would kill a fucking rapist. In D&D, &D, you can kill a fucking rapist, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I mean, shit. Live your dreams, that's the thing. <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> you know, be be the molester murderer that you always wanted to be. You know, your list is just like, okay, that's one less rapist in the world. I'm making D&D a better place, guys. I literally saw a video the other day where a guy was on trial and they were like, so you admit to being guilty? He was like, yep, I killed this dude. And they're like, why'd you kill him? He's like, because he was a child molester. Told him straight up, I'll kill him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, if you do that in the real world, I'm you, you get... Advocate, but like, you know. Well, you do it in the real world, you get caught, and people, like, you, you still go to jail. You yeah. you kill a rapist in D&D, everyone thinks but it's then, funny. But then they, it's also, you get to deal with, like, the moral implications of, like, yeah, you killed someone who's bad but it's like does that make you a good person you know what i mean and then you get the battle that like that mindset you take that oh, away then it's like, like the, the classic uh paladin of the party being like uh, listen you you if you kill him you are sinking to his level we will yeah. bring him to the proper authorities and he shall be judged all right you know you kind of deal with that whole implication of it and you know to take away that like that kind of annoys me because then it's like that'd be like if we're going to remove slavery from like the history books, right. Then it's like, so you're just not going to teach about like a whole culture or an adversity of this culture. Like that's crazy to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say so. But that covers it for news. Yeah. Uh, I well, that's, that's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I think that definitely like for everyone listening, please just, uh, you know, Make sure that everything you do at your table vibes with everyone at your table. Yeah. yeah you know, uh, I know a DM that does a little census of, of what everybody is uh, comfortable with having in a game before their during session zero. And he makes each one of those players sign that sh uh, paper to verify <laughs> that each of them is okay with everything that they uh, said they're okay with. So if it comes up later in the campaign and they say, hey, I'm not okay with this, pulls out the paper. You stated right here that you were okay with those kind of themes. Why did you lie to me? <laughs> Why are you ruining my prep? <laughs> One thing I would also add to that um, in kind of expanding on that idea is anytime I feel like I have a session that is going to be intense like i've done mm -hmm. campaign sessions where we've done like halloween games or prison breaks or other things where i know i'm going to be touching on like horror or mm -hmm. other really intense topics i keep that discussion open with my players and i have the discussion of what can you handle in this topic and what can't you right. And I ask them to be very honest with me and I run the game based on what they tell me. And I think it's, it's up to both people playing and for the player to be honest about your triggers and your needs at the table, especially as game masters. I think it's important for us to tell people what we are comfortable with in our boundaries so that we can respect ourselves as well. Absolutely, because we're all trying to have a fun time together, and by not communicating these things, we end up like back at the start of the episode when we were talking about the RPG horror stories. Those things were never communicated. Like mm -hmm. this person has a trauma from maybe rape, or maybe they were abused, and maybe something happened X, Y, and Z. Those things should have been stated at the very start with the dm maybe in private just be like hey keep these things out of the game if you would mm -hmm. i just want to have fun and i don't want to feel uncomfortable right. and that's all perfectly okay you know everyone wants limits. to be comfortable everyone wants to have a good time yeah and We're like just making a story together. Yeah, every table's different some tables have no limits others have very well defined limits yeah so well, I think we are coming to the end of the episode here, right? Not just about. And we can uh, move right into uh, wrapping up with our uh, good old homebrews. Generic realm! Generic realm! Lots of fun! Excellent! Ah, uh, 
welcome to the generic realm. Now, Sam, I know you uh, have a whole big thing that you were wanted to go over. Why don't you go ahead and do yours, and I'll pick something a little bit shorter. Okay, that sounds fair. I'll have yeah. to edit this stuff later. But let's see what we got here. We got the Wild Moon Armor from uh, Dragons and Stories. You can check out their Patreon. Uh, pretty awesome. I I'm looking at the uh, art here in the stream, and awesome. it, they are very open about it. it, it this is AI art. Now, that might mm -hmm. trigger some people. A lot of people have their own grievances with AI art. But I think this looks really good. Uh, Sam, are you seeing this? Oh, sorry, my buddy. Yeah. Just want to get your opinion on this very barkish armor. Like it's see got. Oh, yeah. The, the pauldrons flare out in a, a rooty uh, mass. You got yeah, some, like a little root flares coming off the gauntlets, a little bit of claw going on on the hands. It, it just very cool. it's very wood and natural looking with little uh, swirls and runes and kind of a tree uh, glowy crest on the chest, a little belt sigil. It looks me amazing. I love it. You know, yeah, I like that a lot. I'll give them credit for good prompting. You know what I mean? It looks nice. But getting into what it does now, there, this armor does come with a curse. So it, it is a. It, this can be any medium armor. It's very rare and requires attunement. Mm. This imposing armor is crafted from the enchanted wood of the, of an ancient forest with sigils of the of ancient cursed of uh, uh, Let's try that again. With sigils of the ancient curse etched into its grain, the armor pulses with a feral essence, and the eyes of the carved beasts glow in an otherworldly light under the moon. While wearing and attuned to the armor, you gain a plus two to your AC. In addition, this bonus applies to your natural armor when you are shapeshifted into any form that grants natural armor. So, okay. yeah, this is specifically engineered for druids because druids don't get enough good armor. We, we all know this. Mm -hmm. Agreed, agreed. So the main thing that this has going for it, besides being good for druids, is Curse of the Wild Moon. When you are attuned to wearing this armor, you bear the curse of lycanthropy. In the presence of the moon, you can use your action to undergo a transformation into a lycanthrope. The specific form of lycanthropy you assume is selected when you first don the armor and can be altered uh, only during a full moon. This transformation lasts until dawn or until you are reduced to zero hit points, at which point you revert to your original form. If you choose to revert back to your original form before dawn using an action, you suffer one level of exhaustion due to the strain on your body. Okay, okay. I think it sounds pretty fun. Yeah, it's pretty cool. well, what do you think, Thomas? Um, I I love it. I'm actually um, I'm a big fan of druids. I um. Personally, I ran a campaign once where one of the big bads was um, a tiefling druid combo, and their whole thing was they were trying to terraform the earth to a hellscape. Um, and it was really fun because we had um, a whole situation where uh, we had a couple of druids in the party, and they had a strong moral contrast, and I would be really interested to see how that would play out in that campaign with that armor. Absolutely. And I'm going to switch that. Okay, uh, Sam. So you got your uh, homebrew here. Let me uh, pull that up. I do, I do. I was able to find something really cool. Kind of caught my eye as soon as I saw it. Shout out to Cinderblock Sally. Oh, let's see. 
I guess I gotta alter that a little bit. But there, no, it's good. It's good. Oh, okay, go for it. So today I present. Uh, <laughs> it, it is. It's very celestial, as the name would suggest. All right. Okay, so like a returning dagger. While holding the weapon, you may cast Misty Step. Okay, cool. While holding the weapon, you can also use an act. All right, all right. I like that. And I, this is interesting because I like that it doesn't give you like. I like the idea, especially because. I've heard many DMs, many, many yeah. DMs make magic items that evolve with the players over time. Now, mm -hmm. this right here is definitely one such uh, item, but what really makes it stand out is I like that it has a formula, three states, dormant, awakened, ascendant, which you can easily like. Tons of people are going to homebrew this style of weapon anyways, but this provides an excellent format, and I love that. Yeah. Last but not least, we have the Ascendant. Weapon bonus increases to plus three. The DC of the Sickle's special reality warp attack increases to 17. Nice. I love Steelwood Strike. It's so cool. Blurry of this blade. That's so cool. Well, like as Tulak always says, it's yeah. got that nothing personal kid energy. You know? <laughs> it does. I. This is a weapon that like. I'm just glad it's a sickle and not a generic sword. Although you could really just flavor this to be whatever. <laughs> yeah shout out to cinderblock sally love it absolutely and there so thomas uh, do you uh make weapons for uh campaigns where they kind of like evolve over time i know a lot of dms do i've definitely done that um I think for me, I, I also agree. I love that. I love the concept of every evolving weapons. I know you mentioned um, the One Piece campaign. One um, Piece. And one of my favorite things about One Piece is how Devil Fruits awaken. Um, and I I think one I for me that's one of the coolest aspects of One Piece. Um. And in general, as someone who tries to keep weapons unique and tailored to players, 
to kind of help players have more individuality in a world where, frankly, I believe anything can and should happen. Um, I, I like the idea of a character having like that custom kind of walking into a battle with the badass weapon kind of thing. The other I way agree. I love to describe it is like Blade from the Blade movies with, you know, I think it's really Blade funny games. that you say that because my One Piece character is He wants to outfit the whole party. <laughs> You're also the cook, so I'm excited for that. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And I think where you already have a ton of proficiencies for making stuff already, uh, yeah. there, there's so many weeks that will be spent at sea. Uh, picking up a smithing skill in addition to everything else, totally, definitely doable. One thing that I kind of wish, um, I, I may have totally missed it, but I don't think it's a thing. I really wish One Piece had added into its lore, like, the concept of, like, if you cook a Delaval fruit in a specific dish, something, mm -hmm. like, truly exigent, like, you have to have the right ingredients, but if you were to cook a devil fruit in a specific way in a specific dish, like, you could infuse it into people in a very like unique kind of temporary focus. That's another thing, you know, I'm kind of to explore with this character too. It's so funny that you say that because I, you know, I was told devil fruits are disgusting. It's a fun thought for sure. And something that we can explore over time throughout the campaign. Yeah, we finally got Foundry up and going for that. So I, I'm excited. Uh, I've hated Roll20 for a long time. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I am all over social media and various websites. Um, my Instagram is RH Storytelling. Um, I definitely, like at this point, my brain's definitely a big bit foggy, but um, I can definitely provide, make sure everyone gets all my links. Um, additionally, I do also create on Patreon, but I am probably a lot more of a novice than the people you've mentioned already. Um, and I am always glad to have conversations pe with people around the idea of neurodiversity and gaming and tabletop RPGs and events even outside that. So if you ever want to email me um, at nbttrpg at gmail and have discussions and share ideas, please feel free to do that. But I'm a massive believer in the power of questions, so... Questions are the answer. And with, with that, absolutely, everybody check him out. And, you know, it's amazing what a little bit of homebrew uh, can do. Like, uh, even though you might not think of yourself as that experienced, sometimes, like, you can just make something truly amazing, you know? Thank you. I mean, hey, like, we, we meet so many people just from talking about the homebrew at the end of these episodes, you know? And they sometimes hit us up and they're like, hey, thank you for talking about this. I was really proud of this piece. So, you know, just thanks for giving us a little little extra love. And it's always nice to hear people like that. You know, everyone deserves the recognition for their work. It's something we strive for here. Yeah. Sure. Well, hope you all enjoyed this episode. I believe we're about done. Yep. Yeah. Dungeons and talk shows. We're nerds. What do we know?
Yeah, check us out on the socials, the podcasting places, or whatever platform you have, because we're casting a wide net, and we'll see y'all next week. I'm going to go eat Thanksgiving leftovers. Hot damn. <laughs> Have a good night. All right. That was great.